And there we have our third and final guest, Rupert Barrett, called The Bear, after the comic strip character much loved by his late mother. Chiseled, square jaw with a feral, craggy face. A winter man, bleak on the eye and raw to the senses. Once a revered English rugby union star, and now the owner of Bear Cave nightclubs, places catering for a wide variety of nighttime tastes, predominantly in the northwest of England. A sturdily built man with brown hair and hazel eyes and the same lack of personality as any one of the many men he employed on the doors of his five nightclubs. His goals in life had all been fulfilled. Adulation, fame and wealth. But those without personalities have few wishes beyond the materialistic and Rupert was no different in that regard. Susan and Rupert had been seeing each other, occasionally living together, over a shorter period than a year. It was a turbulent relationship, no more so than when Rupert criticised Susan's left-wing ideals. When was the last time you read anything other than a comic book or bothered to watch anything other than the sports news, you big, thick bear? The question was asked with a smile on Susan's face, but a dagger hidden in her voice ready to stab him if the answer was not to her liking. What's the point? All news reporting is as I said, biased in one direction or the other. She indulged him, but Alice did not. Do you not believe anything that's reported in newspapers or on the news, Rupert? I stopped believing newspapers when I met Susan, Alicia. She's too beautiful to be bothered by the truth. And as for news channels, I think they're sponsored by their individual political lapdogs, with the idea of making ordinary people feel guilty if they're not given to one or another charity to save the world. Do any of them report good news? No, not a single one. But good things do happen. They're not reported because people might start thinking, hey-ho, this life ain't so bad after all. Let's start living it up a bit without the guilt of the whole of Africa sitting on our shoulders. Let's go clubbing and dance the night away, therefore putting more money in my tills. His laugh split the room with a rat-a-tat-tat, -tat, like a machine gun opening up in the stillness and silence of a high-vaulted church. Giles smiled smugly, sharing Rupert's knowledge of how beautiful Susan was. Susan smiled stoically, well versed in Rupert's views on charity and governments, whilst Alice forged onwards. So you agree with me about lies being the currency of today's world, Rupert? Yes, I do. With news reporting, it's because the journalists either want to be or are told to be newsmakers. I know I'm seldom told the whole truth by the managers of my clubs. That's why I employ a couple of real heavies to make sure the pilfering doesn't exceed what I budget for. Are you saying you threaten these managers of yours, Rupert? Giles asked, feigning surprise with widened eyes. If you know a better way of stopping someone else's hands in what's mine, then I'd listen. But surely, Giles, isn't what I do the same as the punitive justice system you represent? Hold a rod of iron over the would-be wrongdoers? That's if they're caught, of course. Do you punish those managers who do steal from you, Rupert? Alice asked naively, but it was Susan who answered. Where are you going with this, Alicia? Of course he punishes them. What business owner wouldn't? Would you want him and all those involved in commerce to include wording in the employment contract to reflect the degree of penalty imposed in proportion to any theft? Steal a bottle of water and your contract is torn up. You're flogged for the theft of a sandwich, and if you dare to pocket an apple without paying, then kiss your life away as the executioner sings God Save the Queen, swinging the axe. Her sonorous voice resonated around the room. Giles beckoned the man dressed in white livery who stood by the window overlooking the Thames to serve more of the open champagne that rested beside the other bottles on the antique serving cabinet. Skillfully he glided along both sides of the oblong dining table, refilling the crystal glasses, then returned to his position and effortlessly uncorked another Dom Perignon, placing it back in its bucket of ice. Impassively he gazed across the river, noticing the floodlights now ablaze in Battersea Park, lighting the football pitches, oblivious to the conversation in the room, having waited at several dinner parties held in the more intimate surroundings of a home, instead of the restaurant where he, his wife, and the chef once plied their trade. 